Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I'm your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined once again by a very special guest. I had him on my show not too long ago. You all loved him. The comments were great. Y'all wanted him back. And so here he is. We are joined today by Razib Khan. Mr. Khan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Just, you know, give the people what they want. Mr. Khan, for those of my subscribers who may not have seen your previous episode, would you mind telling the audience a little bit about yourself today and where they can find out more information on you and what you do? All right. Um, so I guess like the number one thing is I'm pretty easy to find online. Um, I would suggest going to Razib.com. Uh, that's where I put all of my links and pointers to my podcast and my blogs. Uh, right now, I'm devoting a lot of time to uh, my Substack, Razib.substack.com. And check it out. If you like what you see there, um, do consider subscribing. Um, you know, I'm really enjoying working on long form writing about genetics and history together, kind of what we're going to be talking about here. Um, you know, I write a couple of those a month and they're really long. You know, last month I wrote two on Indian history, 10,000 words. So, um, you know, just if you're interested in what we talk about here, consider checking that out. I have a blog called Gene Expression. Uh, I do other stuff related to like Indian politics and culture at Brown Pundits. Um, I write sometimes for Quillette. Um, I have one podcast, um, you know, just that I do myself on topics I'm interested in. And I am hosted on other podcasts. And uh, yeah, just go to Receive.com. You'll see all of that stuff and just my interests. And uh, that's basically where you should go. And to my subscribers, definitely check out the links in the video description below. I'm going to have a variety of links there where you can check out Mr. Khan and all of the awesome things that he is currently working on and the things that he has put out in the past. I highly recommend it, and I can't encourage you to do so enough. Today, I'm bringing you a very special episode, and it's going to deal with a particular favorite for many of you on YouTube who love history and, more importantly, origins and the history of where we have come from. And so today we're going to be discussing not just the Indo-Europeans and their legacy that we can see in our own world, but where they came from. Before diving into this episode, Mr. Khan, I want to ask you, when you hear the term Indo-European, what comes to mind for you specifically? This is going to be kind of um, a little out of left field, I think, for a lot of listeners because it's very personal. Um, when I was in third grade, uh, I was in, um, in, in a school that was kind of like lower socioeconomic status, but, um, you know, my teacher, she saw something in me and, you know, there's a whole long story and, um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link, uh, Nick, so you can post it about my teachers, but, um, I transferred schools to an academic, academically gifted school because of her, because of her, um, kind of push, so to speak. But, uh, she gave me like a bunch of, um, a bunch of books, uh, that she had. And she's like, no one else is going to really read these, so I'm going to give them to you. She shouldn't really done that, you know. It's like it's district district property, right? Uh, but she gave me this huge dictionary, and at the beginning of the dictionary, there's a map with all the language families of the world. I had never seen anything like that, and then I saw the word Indo-European. I'm like, whoa, that's weird. Um, that's all over the world, and you know, my family's from Bangladesh, um, and so I speak Bengali not very well. I'm not going to front here. But I speak Bengali, which like you know, two hundred some million people in the world speak it. It's not an obscure language. It's one of the top, you know, five, six, seven, whatever. Um, but uh, I was shocked to learn that Bengali is distantly related to English. And so I was like, oh, that how how, how did that happen? That's just that's isn't that crazy? I mean, that's that was you know, I'm eight years old and I'm thinking this is crazy. This makes no sense, you know. And uh, but then I thought back to like um, like various words. And so, you know, I was taking French also, um, you know, in elementary school. And there were just similarities of certain words. It's like, you know, like um, like the, the word in Bengali for grass is gosh. So it's like very similar when you think about it, you know. And I had never thought about it before. Or like the word in Bengali for teeth is dot, which is just like dent right? Or dot. So it's like there's these ancient conserved Indo-European words and it's like, oh, okay. And all the, the number of words are, are really, are really, really clear. Like, you know, two is dui, you know? So um, you could just hear it. But I had never like made the connection um, until I saw that map. And so when I see Indo-European, I think back to the map 
I think back to that orange dictionary. I still remember the dictionary cover. It's hardcover orange. I remember opening up and just being shocked at like half the old world being covered by this one language family. To set a foundation of relevance for this episode, before we get into what I know most of our audience is waiting for, what would you say the main contributions are when it comes to the Indo-Europeans and their legacy? Well, I mean, obviously the language that you see all around you you know, it's almost a tautology, like Indo-European is the language family, right? But, I mean, there are certain motifs, um, certain folklore uh, that uh, recur throughout many Indo-European societies. So, for example, um, if any of you read Greek mythology, and also I, I think this is present in some Norse myths as well, but uh, the Divine Twins, uh, um, it's also present in Indo-European and Indian um, mythology, the Ashvin Twins uh, show up. And so there are these um, particular um, forms and motifs that bind all the Indo-European languages, uh, uh, peoples, because they're peoples, right? They adopt this culture. Um, and there's aspects of the religion that, um, you know, also thread them to. So, um, you know, uh, the Indo-European high god, the Vedic high god, um, was not very co- prominent in Hinduism, I want to make clear today, but is uh, Dayus uh, Pitter, I believe, right? So just like Jupiter or Zeus Potter, right? So it's that same God that's uniting all these different peoples. And sometimes you see weird things. Um, for example, uh, having intercourse during the day is considered uh, um, sinful in Greek mythology. And when, I, one time I was reading a translation of the Mahabharata, and it was specifically mentioned as being sinful. Okay? It, it, so it's like it's it's actually foreshadowing that something bad is happening. People who do that, they're bad people. So it's like, okay, for some reason, the Indo-Europeans in their carts, they thought this was bad, right? And their cultural descendants thousands of years later on different ends of Eurasia still think it's bad. So you see this, like, it's like um, Easter eggs of all these cultural practices that you recognize um, after thousands of years. When it comes to the Indo-Europeans and where they come from, would you mind walking my subscribers through the traditional viewpoints that have been held on this topic? When you look at the map of Indo-European languages, I would say that probably, I like this, some of this is historic. So, um, you know, most of Anatolia, they speak Turkish today, but it was historically Indo-European, whether it be Hittite or um, Phrygian or, you know, Greek, Armenian, um, you know, Central Asia was also Iranian speaking until recently. And in fact, much of the Ukraine was also Iranian speaking. So, you know, historically, this whole zone, like half of the territory from, say, the Elba in Germany, all the way to maybe India has been considered a potential homeland um, historically. So say, you know, 250 years ago in Max Muller um, and his, um, the early philologists noticed the similarities between Sanskrit which is the uh, you know liturgical holy language of Hinduism and Greek and Latin because everyone knew Greek and Latin. Well, not everyone, but you know the cultural elites that knew Greek and Latin, and they immediately saw the similarities that I have just mentioned with these core words, and so that's when the whole Indo-European term came about, right? I mean, sometimes it was called Indo-German because German scholars were involved in it, but that's not really a term we use. We just say Indo and European, which uh, to me it makes sense because you know outside of Iran and a few other areas. You know, like 90% of the people that speak these languages are in Europe or the Indian subcontinent. So I I think that's a reasonable term. But, um, you know, today, I think um, scientifically, if you want me to elaborate, um, you know, there are traditionally several prime candidates. So Colin Renfrew, an archaeologist uh, out of uh, England, he proposed in the 1970s this hypothesis Indo-European languages spread with agriculture. And so they're from Anatolia. And so these farmers expanded in demographic waves they called demic diffusion um, in these small-scale societies with high reproductive rates. And they expanded throughout Europe, and they brought the Indo-European languages, you know, over like 8,000 BC or whatever in Greece, all the way to, you know, 4,000 years ago, the very, very northern parts of Europe. And, um, you know, presumably the same would happen in India. So that's the Anatolian hypothesis. The other primary hypothesis, um, the Anatolian hypothesis promoted mostly by archaeologists, you know, um, the other primary hypothesis on the West has been the Pontic Steppe hypothesis, which is the Pontic Steppe is like, think about like, you know, Black Sea between the Dnieper and all the way to the Volga. So basically Eastern Ukraine into like North of the Caucasus region. Um, a lot of philologists like J.P. Mallory have really, um, really promoted this. Now they believe 
that this makes sense because when you look at the common core words of the Indo-European languages from India all the way to Western Europe, uh, they suggest to people who, you know, they were familiar with salmon and beech trees and, you know, certain other things that are found in Northern Eurasia, but in particularly east of the Elbe. Well, I mean, beech trees are obviously to the west of the Elbe, but I'm just saying what they did is a Venn diagram of all the different things and it eliminated Western Europe, eliminated India, eliminated Iran, and so what are you left with? You're left with this core zone around the Pontic Steppe. Um, you know, they obviously knew, um, you know, horses and things like that. They might not have been like mounted, but, or even chariots, but they knew how to use horses in some way. And they had cattle and they were pastoralists. Um, there's other more recent things I do want to mention real quickly. Um, the Indo-Iranian languages, they show weird evidence of uh, influence from, believe it or not, Uralic languages. So um, that is indicative, and I can get into that later if you want, of why, but there's probably early contact between the Indo-Iranian you know, predecessor societies and Uralic, like Finnic, Ugric uh, peoples. And now, as we approach our modern day in a world of scientific advancement, and especially when it comes to ancient DNA, on the subject of ancient DNA, has it told us anything about the origins of the Indo-Europeans. So much, so much, um, you know, it's raining, we're raining samples here. We're raining samples. Uh, you know, you can do population genomics with ancient DNA from Indo-European agropastoralists. So, you know, um, you know, a lot of my interlocutors online, they ask me questions and instead of giving a speculative answer, I can give you um, a very um, concrete answer because we've got the DNA. So, for example, um, you know, I wrote a couple of posts about Indian genetics on my Substack. Uh, just check that out, Rezeeb.substack, you know. But, um, you know, very long pieces, 10,000 words total. And I point out that, like, you know, you can actually analyze um, the predecessors of the ancient Iranians um, yourself because you can download the data I have. And so um, to give a concrete, you know, like something like, quote, controversial, um, I will say that like there have been people of a certain uh, ideological persuasion that want to say that the ancestors of the Indo-Aryans were, you know, basically Nordic looking people. Um, I frankly don't care if they were or not. It's just, I'm not like butthurt either way. There's, you know, some of our ancestors, whatever. But um, I actually pulled down, I think it was like 50 some samples from the Sintashta culture, which is descended directly from a, um, I think it's called the Abyshevo culture of like, it's kind of like central Russia. And then they migrated on the other side of the Urals and the Sintashta were like occupied northern Kazakhstan. They invented the light war chariot. And it seems like they were the predecessors of the Indo-Iranian peoples that occupied Iran and South Asia. Okay. So I pulled this DNA and I looked at them and I ran some inferences myself through a uh, basically a polygenic risk or calculator. And, um, you know, it looks like you would probably call them white, but they mostly had dark hair and only 25% of them had blue eyes. So instead of having like these arguments based on random texts, I pulled the ancient DNA and I actually looked, okay? So I can say definitively myself because, you know, I looked. I ran it through the algorithm. I manually looked and check the eye color stuff because you can manually look, okay? And so I can tell you what they look like. And they're mostly, you could say brown-eyed white people, okay? Say something like that. So it makes no one happy probably. Like Indians are probably a little angry because they're just like, you know, what are you trying to say? And then, you know, the white whatever people are just like, wait, are you trying to say that all these awesome people didn't look like um, that guy in the Thor movies. And so, I mean, you know, obscure fact, I've actually looked really closely at the DNA. It looks like Northern Europe has been gone, going through lots of selection for lighter pigmentation over the last 3,000 years. So the original Indo-Europeans that settled there from the steppe, they were actually did not look nearly as pale as people there do today. And so that's kind of a weird, interesting fact, and nobody really knows why that is. But I just want to bring that up because people, um, when they think of the Indo-Europeans and Aryans, you know, they have some negative associations with Nazis and Teutonic supermen. Um, I just want to be clear, like we actually have the DNA, and I can tell you they didn't actually look like that. They looked more like brunette white people is the, what I would say if you want to think colloquially. Like the Nordic phenotype that we're used to, the Nordic physical 
suite of characteristics is actually relatively recent, and it's due to some really strong selection in that region of the world. We don't know totally why, um, but um, just putting that out there, all this stuff is not about Indo-Europeans. It's about our cultural obsessions, fixations, and our just ideological currents that are happening in the modern world. And so we've talked about the original traditional thought of where they came from. We've talked about what DNA tells us. And now, because I want your input on this as well, do you have any personal thoughts or theories involving this topic yourself? It, it is, you know, for a lot of us out there, it is also personal. So my Y chromosome is actually R1A, Z93, which is associated with, um, so 80% of um, the Sintashta males that were buried in Kazakhstan um, are my... R1A Z ninety three, okay, so that's my paternal ancestors right there that are buried. <laughs> so that's really, I mean, personal. Like it's it's really personal. And so the first place you discover this particular lineage is in a culture um, that occupies like kind of a latitudinal zone to the east and west of Moscow, um, four thousand five hundred years ago. So, so it, it's kind of amazing to think like, okay, these my paternal ancestors were, what were they doing in the Russian forest step? And why did they go so far? Um, you know, over like, you know, 500 years, about 500 years, they went south and they, they got to South Asia. I mean, that's pretty incredible, right? On the other end, in Western Europe, there's a lot of men who are R1B, which is our brother lineage. And, um, you know, that is found in the Yamna people uh, of the, you know, Pontic Steppe about 5,000 years ago. And it's really increased in frequency in Northern Europe, um, in Western Europe in particular, uh, over the last 4,000 years, like mostly between 4,500 and 3,000 years ago. And so what you're seeing is um, the rise of these patrilineal societies because they're not really associated with maternal lineages. They're associated with these patrilineal societies. And ancient DNA has been able to get into cemeteries, has been get into burial grounds. And it's showing us that these Indo-Europeans, like a lot of people, so it's not exclusive to Indo-Europeans, but it's very, very true of Indo-Europeans, they tend to be consisting of settlements of related men, and they're related in kinship groups of like, you know, there's a, a father, uh, a pater familius, as the Romans would say, and sons and maybe cousins and brothers and, you know, nephews uh, of like the clan chief. And then the women, um, you can use isotope analysis, right? And you can see that they were born very far away. So the women are not related to each other. Um, this is um, very similar to what you would see in the Roman system, uh, where a lot of the daughters, they just had a name like Julia, which is because she's the girl of the family, Julia. You know, women are, are ancillary to these patr patrilineal um, systems. Now, in India, in northern India, you have a, well, actually, in India in general, you have a gotra system, which is a paternal lineage. And in north India, um, women move to the man's village and they have really strict rules of uh, inbreeding, so the men have to find women from other villages. What you see in the ancient Indo-European burials from 5,000 years ago, from what was assumed to be ancient Indo-European, is the exact same pattern. So the culture of these people was very patriarchal, very patrilineal. This was hypothesized looking at the mythology by you know, people in the late 19th, early 20th century. An archaeologist named Maria Gimbutis had this theory of an old Europe that was conquered by the new Europe. She was wrong about the idea that old Europe was uh, matrilineal. It looks like old Europe as well was pretty violent and, frankly, patri patriarchal as well. But, but the Indo-Europeans definitely were very patriarchal. She was totally right about that. Um, you know, in Scandinavia, the Indo-Europeans seem to be associated with something called the Badlax culture. And there's the hypothesis these Badlaxes are ceremonial. I, I, I don't think – I think it's telling you something, that the most important, like, precious objects are – axes and you're calling them battle axes so what you're seeing is a rapid turnover of uh men from one generation to the next so there's an intrusion of males so the rise of indo-europeans is um a pretty brutal frankly um story of the rise of a particular set of men and so what you see with the y chromosomes the paternal lineage is what we in genetics call star phylogenies and a star phylogeny is expands so rapidly so genghis khan produced a star phylogeny in central eurasia it expands so rapidly that you can't actually find its internal structure because generation to generation its demographic increase was so fast so four thousand years ago 
a bunch of star phylo- like several star phylogenies associated with, associated with Indo-European speaking groups occurred on the Y chromosome. And it's strongly suggestive to me that um, a particular social arrangement of uh, patrilineal um, descent, some clan structure was extremely, extremely effective at intergroup warfare. Okay, because they expanded from the Atlantic to the Bay of Bengal. That's pretty huge. Um, you know, this isn't like, this can't be random. Like, there's something that they have. And so, so, so what do they have? I mean, they don't have machine guns. They're not like European colonialists with a Maxim gun. You know, they don't have quinine to prevent themselves from, you know, getting malaria. I mean, they, they don't have a lot of the advantages that we would assume that like a conquering society would have. So, so what do they have? I think that they had like particular social arrangements um, that are extremely effective in intergroup warfare. That's what I think. And they replaced the local men and um, they took the local women. So there's evidence in Germanic languages that a lot of the agricultural terminology, agricultural substrate is not Indo-European. So they conquered farmers and they married the farmers' women and these women passed the farming terminology to their sons um, from this pre-Indo-European society, right? And so um, in terms of, you know, I believe we will come to an understanding that um, this was a violent, like, Mongol-scale expansion. Um, it's not in one generation like the Mongol Empire, and it wasn't under the same political unit. But, um, you know, we see – so I, I can tell you um, – I can tell the listeners right now this hasn't been published, but I, I have talked to people. Um, you can see there are men who are – Three five thousand years ago, buried in Mongolia, the Altai, who are like third or fourth cousins to men that were buried on the Dnieper, um, the banks of the Dnieper in the Ukraine, um, just like a generation or two uh, previous. So these people were like moving, like massive distances, and also genetically, like the people. This like so I'm talking about the Afanasivio culture in the Altai. Genetically, it's exactly like the Yamna culture, which is in Ukraine. So they moved without mixing at all with intervening period people, which means that they must have moved really fast and they must have sent scouts out to know where the good pastures were. So they had some intelligence. And, you know, that's what we saw with the Mongol expansion. They had intelligence. They scouted. They actually planned. And I don't, I don't think there was any empire. I don't think that there was any, you know, I, we don't know. We'll never know at the end of the day. But um, I think that you know they had a really incredible social organization to make it as far as they did and to expand as much as they did. Because every European society um, between 3000 and 2000 BC um, fell to them. Right. First, it was Northern Europe, but we see the same intrusion in Spain and in Italy and Greece. Um, happened in India. It happened in Iran. So Indo-European ancestry, steppe ancestry, shows up in Iran about four thousand years ago in the northern edge of Iran. And you know, by the time the Assyrians show up, Persians are speaking Indo-European languages. Right. That was like a thousand years. They assimilated all the local Iranian cultures, like the Elamites that you know I talked to in the previous previous uh, stream with you. We talked to the Elamites. They disappeared. The Persians replaced the Elamites. Like ancient Elam is where. Far as is right, so they absorb them. So this is a very synthetic group of people that will absorb the local people and expand really rapidly. And um, you know, history belongs. To, you know, history is written by the winners. It belongs to the winners, and they're winners. That's what we saw.